after we made these discoveries, somebody made a computer-generated ideal hexagonal chandelier. Let's see how well that fits to Van Eyck's chandelier. Well, at first glance, it's incredible. If you look a little more carefully, well, he misses there by a little bit. He misses by two millimeters. Well, what I'm going to show you as we go along is if he had constructed that chandelier using the laws of perspective, which had not been discovered then, they didn't come along for much later, he could have, in principle, done something that was perfect. If he'd projected a real chandelier, a real chandelier intrinsically is imperfect. And I'll show you how imperfect they are as we go. So just the, the fact it fits so well, but not perfectly, alone is very strong circumstantial evidence that optics was involved, and there's much more. Well, but if I claim optics was involved 1425, we know Galileo 1600, how did they you know, have optics back then? So we'll talk about optics. If we go back in time, this um, David Lindbergh compiled a list um, of treatises, textbooks on optics, in the period 1000, which is an important period there, uh, because of someone I'm going to mention in a minute, an Arab scientist, Ibn al-Haytham, to the time of Van Eyck. There was one new textbook in geometrical optics written every seven years. They're not written that often, that frequently today. So unlike what we thought, the, the medieval period was just Cro-Magnons fighting dinosaurs. In fact, it was a period of intense intellectual activity. Unfortunately, the people back then weren't very intelligent. They didn't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in spite of that, some of their writings have been translated into modern European languages. In fact, very few of their writings have been translated into modern European languages. But those that have been translated tell you exactly how to make a concave mirror. So let's make a concave mirror. I made a, a concave mirror with just grinding paste. I made several of them, so I got better at it. Um, a concave mirror and grinding paste I made in one hour. It just happened that I went to make one. I looked at my watch right when I was starting. It was right on the hour. And I'm polishing away. I'm making good progress. And uh, some of you probably made telescope mirrors and stuff. And you know how careful you have to be going from one grade of polishing to the next grade of polishing. Well, if you decide you're going to get this done in an hour, you can, can't be quite so careful. So I looked at my watch. I was like 45 minutes into it. And I thought, I'll finish in an hour, no matter what. And I just hurried along. That mirror I made in an hour, um, those of you who aren't from the Southwest don't know, that's called a saguaro cactus. Um, this is my backyard, and there's a wrought iron fence. And you can see on there the bar of the wrought iron fence. Um, that gives us a scale. We know how wide that is, 1.2 centimeters. I know how far away I am. I calculate the angular resolution of the mirror I made in one hour. And there's two categories of people. Those who know too much about optics, and that's all of you, and those who know too little about optics. You're going to leave here tonight knowing just the right amount of optics. <laughs> and the right amount is that not that the Hubble mirror, if you think in that terms, the Hubble mirror is 2,000 times better resolution than the one I made in an hour. However, Van Eyck, for every feature that he made, if it were based on optical projections, he needed a mirror that was could have been three times worse than the one I made. So you don't need a very good mirror to do optics. Well, how bad a mirror do you need? I bought this, uh, this ladle from a wholesale restaurant supply house here in Tucson. It has multiple curvatures. It's got holes in it. It's made out of stainless steel. It's, it's spot welded. Could you focus an image with that? Any bets? Yes. <laughs> well, you'd be cool if you said no. <laughs> In fact, you can focus an image with that. It's not the world's greatest image, but it's a perfectly recognizable image. If you'd use that ladle back before Brunelleschi, you drew lines along the top where that building is recognized, they would come to vanishing points, you would invent a perspective, and you'd be famous. So <coughs> you use really bad optics to project images. One of the nice things about being involved with somebody as famous as David Hockney is people like this Professor Peter Schroeder contacted me and said, you're easier to find than Hockney. Um, are you aware of the discussion of mirrors and the romance of the rose? I'd never heard of the romance of the rose. 
I went to the Barnes and Noble bookstore here in Tucson, and there were two copies on the shelf. The way things work in modern publishing is things go out of print like five nanoseconds after they're published because of the tax law. The fact that there were two copies on the shelf tells you it's widely read today, and if you look around, you'll discover in the humanities it's widely read, and that's why 150 years before Van Eyck, it's why um, it's available today. And if you read the introduction by the translator, it was one of the most widely read works of the French language at the time of Jan Van Eyck, who was the court painter for the court of Burgundy, who presumably spoke French. If we look, there are four pages where mirrors are discussed. And of course you can't read this, so I'll, I'll magnify it in a second. But one place it says, El Azain, this is Ibn al Haytham, the Arab scientist from around the year 1000, um, wrote the book of optics. You'll be able to discover the causes and strengths of these mirrors. And we've made some actually remarkable discoveries about this Ibn al Haytham, which has taken me on some very nice um, uh, lectures in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and places. So the um, person who wrote this book, 150 years before uh, Van Eyck says, I'm not going to tell you about the shapes of mirrors. You're smart people. I can, if I describe the, the property of the mirror, you'll understand whether I mean a flat mirror, or a convex mirror, a concave mirror. Everything is written elsewhere in a book. I can tell you, raise the reflection, describe your angles. Seems like pretty technical language for a medieval French epic poem. <laughs> so if we look here, certain mirrors, and you know, only going to use the word mirror, if you put a large bulky object very close, that bulky object will look very small. Um, even the largest mountains between France and Sardinia can be seen to be tiny. Sardinia is a province in the Pyrenees next to Andorra. Coincidentally, before I even found this out, um, those are the mountains between France and Sardinia. <laughs> and I, I gave a lecture at the Guggenheim Bilbao, and BMW kindly loaned me a motorcycle, and I took a tour. And so those mountains, if you put those in front of a convex mirror, a security mirror, things are small. So we can tell just from the way that works. Well, certain mirrors, whoops, let me go back for a second, even make phantoms appear quite alive outside the mirror, either in water and air. It's not like water and air rhyme in French, neither modern French nor medieval French. Water and air were of great interest to the philosophers at the time. Air, light travels forever. A solid light doesn't go through at all. Water is kind of funny. And sometimes water behaves like a transparent substance. Sometimes it behaves like a solid substance. So they were interested in that. So I want you to listen to how a 21st century artist describes this projected image, which of course is upside down, because projected images are upside down, and compare his words with those written in the Romance of the Rose 150 years before Van Eyck. And I realized this is the color moving. It moves. I mean, there it is. It's spinning. It's quite beautiful. Of course, it's upside down. The string's coming from the bottom. And I then realized, my God, this is, a, this is a movie in color. They must have seen it 600 years ago. Well, David was wrong. They saw it 700 years ago. <laughs> so to this point, what I've done is I've shown you that they understood how to make the necessary optics. They understood how to project images. That doesn't mean that they actually did use it. So now I have to show you optical evidence in painting. In this part, I'm going to go through very fast because it's late in the afternoon and you're all um, experts in optics. I'm going to go through the optics that you need to know to, anal to analyze the evidence I'm going to show you for the rest of the talk. One thing you've learned, parallel lines all come to a vanishing point. Turns out that what you've learned is an oversimplification for our purposes. These telephone telegraph poles are along the same track, but if you look more closely, they deviate. And that's because they're not perfectly along a straight line with the track. So if we look at a painting like this and we look for vanishing lines, how many of you have been to Italy? If you've been to Italy, many of you, you know there's no Italian <coughs> city built with this level of perfection, where the facade of that building <laughs> is exactly parallel to the facade of that building. And it's Italy. <laughs> so we know because this fits too well, that the laws of perspective, which by this time have been articulated, were used to lay out this painting. 
So this is from a widely used textbook. In this case, our camera, our eye, is above the object in question. Therefore, all the vanishing lines come to vanishing points that are on a horizon line at the height above the object that our camera is at. Well, I'm going to show you a photograph I took below the chandelier. That's a real chandelier. That's an object-based image. I took the photograph myself with a digital camera. But where are the vanishing points? Where's the horizon line? It's not what we were taught. Somebody lied to us. Well, we were taught a simplified version of perspective. Real perspective, these chandelier arms, if one is forward or back by a few millimeters from the other, by the time you extrapolate to the horizon line, it's just all off. Yet, to your eye, that chandelier looks good enough that if you wanted to purchase that, you'd be willing to pay the $200. So this is what um, what we're going to expect to see for real projected objects, not that. And science has to be reproducible. That's a different chandelier in a different Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to say, both Home Depots are in Tucson, Arizona, and both on Broadway Boulevard. <laughs> so I keep meaning to go to a, a, a Lowe's on a different street in another city and see if it's reproducible. Another thing we're going to make use of. There's David Hockney visiting my lab. If you didn't know how tall he was, we'll make an estimate. Average height of European male. Here, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with that. That tells us the distance across the scene at the depth into the scene David is standing. Everybody knows how big a molecular beam epitaxy machine is, so we don't have to look that up. That tells us that the angular distance across the scene tells us that a 22 millimeter focal length lens on a 35 millimeter camera was used. My technician used a 24 millimeter focal length lens. So within the uncertainties of our estimate, that's perfect agreement. But it, it has to be. We're talking about the laws of geometrical optics. So if Van Eyck has painted an MBT machine in one of his paintings, we'll know what focal length it is. <laughs> um, here's Arnold. He looks into the scene. I'll tell you what changes. Not just, it's not just that the focus has changed, but if we look at the back of this trailer and we identify a particular set of reflections, we know how tall the image was. We know the original magnification, because we can look up what was filmed. We make an estimate for Arnold's head size. Magnification <laughs> is 0.06. <coughs> every sort of portrait you've seen, this, not everyone, most portraits you've seen in a portrait gallery are sort of, you know, half life size. This is 10 times smaller than that. The effect I'm going to show you is even larger when magnification is increased. But you, you can see it in film. Back of the trailer, reflection. We focus part way back, the reflection has moved. Either Arnold's stare is so strong that it caused the trailer to shrink, or optics is involved. And the optics that's involved is, as you know, I focus on the person in the front row. I change my mind. I want to focus on the clock in the back. Counterintuitively, I have to pull the lens toward me. That reduces the magnification of the scene. And we're going to make use of that. Again, for those for you from back east, those are called mountains. <laughs> I'll let you know where I'm going. So we zoom in. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Same estimate of magnification ends up about the same. We zoom in. We increase the magnification by a factor of three. We decrease the depth of field from kilometers to meters. So the next thing we're going to make use of is increasing the magnification decreases the depth of field. And we'll use that to extract evidence. So here's how we propose Van Eyck did this. There's somebody dressed like a, a character in a, a non-Van Eyck <laughs> painting. His image is reflected and focused upside down as a movie in living color on the inner wall of the studio. The artist then traces in the features that he needs to know, corners of the eyes, nostrils, whatever he needs to know to create the portrait. And that can be done very quickly, only a few minutes. Optics is captured at that point, and then fills in the rest from real life as he wishes. So the amount of capturing by optical projection can be small, but critical to the overall business. So at this point, we've got a drawing. Later, if you want this to be a painting, paint it. So here's a 30 second clip of David doing this. Watch this guy's eyeball. He blinks. This had to be really scary back in 1425. <clears throat> and you can see the simple concave mirror, the fidelity that you can project. You can, everything 
in the shallow depth of field, you can see the plants behind him are out of focus. Now he fills in the details like we've always thought that artists have done, but the optics is already there. 